Um, so folks, today I'm very happy to welcome um, not just a good friend of mine, but a, a, <laughs> a very talented historian, um, Nick Fry, who was also kind enough to share an office with me back in graduate school and, and put up with all of my strange um, conversations. So um, as you know, we're pressing on or we're moving down the line with our series on the Civil War in Baltimore. And you can't really talk about Baltimore in the Civil War without talking about the B&O Railroad. Um, and so today, Nick's going to explore the, the significance of the B&O Railroad and then some of John Work Garrett's um, machinations to um, kind of walk that, that thin line there between, um, well, serving the Union or himself or it, anyway, Nick's going to tell you much more about it. But when we think about the B&O Railroad in Baltimore and, you know, throughout Maryland, it's a critical, um, you know, the infrastructure is critical to Baltimore's economy, to the port, and ultimately to the to the safety of Washington, because that uh, that Washington line is going to move, I think, from 60 freight cars a day to 400 in 1861. I can be mistaken, but I know that some real fan will one of you guys will, will correct me. Um, they could probably be the first to do that. So um, essentially, I want to thank first off the Friends of Fort McHenry for supporting this series. Um, and then I want to thank our, um, our historians for joining us. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Nick. He's the curator of the John Berwinger Library, uh, the National Railroad Library out in St. Louis. Um, Nick, if you're all set, I see that you're sharing your screen. So I'm going to be quiet and turn it over to you. Thanks, Shannon. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. It's uh, it's nice to uh, it's nice to give a presentation on Baltimore here in St. Louis. Which um, honestly, if you ever come out here, you're going to find a lot more similarities uh, than differences, um, and that may be one reason why the Browns were taken and became the Orioles. So, um, and I think if you go to St. Louis, unlike any other cities where a team has moved, the people here will be like, thank you for taking the Browns. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the B&O Railroad, John Garrett, and possibly the worst six months to a year that any business executive, particularly in transportation, could have uh, in their lifetime. Uh, this is going to be about the early days of the Civil War uh, in Baltimore, in Virginia, in suburban Washington and in West Virginia. And Walking the Tightrope is a very apt title because that's really what Garrett and the B&O had to do. And some of that was their own fault. So we'll go to our, our next screen here. Hopefully this works. Yes. OK, uh, first, just to give you some background, because not everybody here lives and dies with the B&O Railroad like I do. Um, this is a map from 1858. We have a copy of it at the Berger Library. The Library of Congress has their copy scanned, and that's where I pulled it from. Uh, it is the railroad at the cusp of the Civil War. It's 1858. Uh, the B&O has reached its, um, its pre-Civil War height. There won't be any major expansion until after this is all over. Uh, and we'll just kind of briefly uh, go over uh, some, some uh, geography so folks can orient themselves. Here in the east, you've got Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia is just a little further west. And then you've got Wheeling, Parkersburg, and Grafton, West Virginia in, in the central part of the western part of Virginia at this, this time. This is still Virginia. Virginia is not going to split officially until 1863. Uh, and the B&O has a, a charter with the state of Maryland and the state of Virginia to operate. Uh, they also have substantial investments in the company. Uh, this is the, one of the early public-private partnerships. And uh, they are, the railroad is viewed as essential to the development of, of the two states' economies. Uh, Western Virginia needed an easier way to get its uh, merchandise, uh, particularly coal, to a market, uh, mainly on the East Coast. Uh, Baltimore was looking to compete for Western trade with the cities of Philadelphia and New York. And 
the Ohio River at that time uh, was the great highway. That was the interstate highway system that everybody was working with. Uh, so the early concepts of railroads in the 1830s uh, and uh, was connect a seaport inland and mainly you're gonna connect to a river system to get further west. Uh, by the 1850s, we now have railroads in what we call the Middle West today. Uh, it was called the Old Northwest at the time. And uh, these Eastern lines are already starting to look at the money they're making and looking over the horizon to the next hill, which in this case is going to be the Midwest. Politically, in the 1858 era, we've got uh, a divided country. Uh, this is another Library of Congress map showing free and slave states, and that's basically going to be the dividing line for the Civil War that's going to start in 1861. Uh, as you'll notice, Maryland and Virginia are both slave states. Uh, they are not considered part of the Deep South, but they both have slavery as a part of their economy, and it's legal at the time. Uh, the North and the West, for the most part, are considered free territories and free states. And the B&O is the only uh, major trunk line, and a trunk line is, an, is a railroad that's a, a large railroad going from the seaport west on the east coast that runs through slave states. There are other railroads in the south, but they are not as well-developed, heavily trafficked, uh, or as well networked into the existing United States rail network as the BNO is. It is the furthest south trunk line. It's going to remain that way into the uh, late 19th century. And it really, at the time of the Civil War, it is the only one in the south. And in fact, uh, after the uh, raid on Harper's Ferry by John Brown in 1859, there's a, a, a banquet that's held where Garrett actually says, and John Garrett is the current president of the railroad when this happens, he proclaims the railroad, it is a Southern line, which the audience gives him great applause. And if ever necessity should require, which heaven forbid, it will prove to be the great bulwark of the border and a sure agency for home defense. And he then goes on to talk about how that railroad can move 10,000 troops a day on its own and has a workforce of 3,500 employees who could all be committed to this war effort. The speech was given in Richmond and it was a, a, a partially a thank you uh, for the service that the BNO did to uh, help uh, put down the John Brown raid that was mainly carried out with Virginia militia troops. And Garrett was playing up to his audience, but these words would come back to haunt him in a mere year and a half. Now, Garrett is, um, he's an expansionist president. This is a, another Library of Congress map. It's actually a, a, a post-war era map, uh, but it shows that Garrett's already looking over the next horizon. And for the most part, this rail network is pretty close to what the Civil War rail network looked like. Um, it's more built up. It's an 1870s, 1880s map. But you see that the uh, Baltimore here, you've got the B&O running to Cumberland West. There's the line to Wheeling. There's the line to Parkersburg. And then there are these railroads in Ohio that get you to Cincinnati. Um, Garrett is, again, looking over the horizon. He's already making headway into Ohio and looking at working with local Ohio railroad developers to improve uh, the connections with the BNO and hopefully even if necessary take over the railroads outright uh, in those states that he wants. And his big goal is St. Louis. Uh, Chicago is not Chicago yet. Uh, it's a big city, but St. Louis is still the big trading center because of the river network. Uh, it's the Mississippi port, it's the Missouri River port. If you're going west, you're going to probably have to make some kind of stopover in Missouri. Uh, and St. Louis is generally where you're going to make that stop. So that is the objective for a lot of railroads. I'll go to the next slide. And this is Garrett. This is the man himself. This is the guy we've been talking about already. Um, he became president of the railroad in 1858. Uh, he was the son of Robert Garrett. Uh, the family, uh, Robert Garrett and sons, had made its money trading commodities. Uh, and eventually that became financial instruments. 
uh, and the B&O was an investment that Robert Garrett and Sons put their money into. Uh, first, from the standpoint that they're looking at it as a, uh, a means to help their commodity trading business, but uh, they saw the profit potential in railroads, and the family started investing and got enough stock control through themselves and friends that uh, John could become the president of the railroad. Uh, when he became president, he had kind of a weird situation. Again, it's a public-private company, and the railroad had state directors and it had city directors on its board, in addition to private individuals. Uh, Garrett needed to get rid of those folks. Um, for his programs that he wanted to see uh, go through, the state and city directors were going to be an obstacle. Uh, one thing he wanted to do was to take over all railroads going into and out of Baltimore. He wanted the BO to control or outright own any railroad going into and out of the city. And city directors were against that. Uh, the state directors were not in favor of that. And so he started to get rid of these guys um, through board of directors votes. Uh, he then tried to hostile takeover uh, several railroads that wound up making him a lot of enemies. Uh, he lost a lot of friends in the state government, in the city government, but even worse for him in Pennsylvania. And that's going to come back and haunt him in 1861. Now, Garrett is the president, but he's not the guy that operates the railroad. That's William Prescott Smith. Uh, his title is Master of Transportation, which is probably one of the cooler titles you can ever have in a workplace. Uh, there was uh, Smith's job is essentially operating vice president. Uh, he makes sure the trains run on time, they go where they need to go, and uh, that uh, he will um, let, uh, let any problem that occurs, he'll be de dealing with it. Uh, he'll he'll uh, promote the railroad. He actually did um, a major work for the railroad in 1857 uh, called the Great Railway Celebrations of 1857, where they, they organized and ran a railroad trip between Baltimore and St. Louis over railroads that were friendly to the B&O. And he was using it as a, as a promotional material uh, for the company. And, and he's a very competent guy. Um, he kind of gets overshadowed because he doesn't uh, stay in the industry too long uh, compared to other people. Uh, he inherits a railroad that is pretty much already built. So people like uh, Greenville Dodge uh, and other Western railroad developers like James Hill kind of take over the imagination after the Civil War uh, because of the, the monumental projects they managed. And even in the East Coast, um, his rivals such as Tom Scott of the Pennsylvania Railroad um, seem to have greater ambitions and wind up getting a lot more press uh, in the post-Civil War era. But the reason the B&O Railroad actually was able to run trains is mainly due to Smith and his team. Uh, and, and it's kind of a shame that he's overshadowed like that. Part of it is that it's very hard to find primary source material on Smith and uh, and if it ever happens that we do find a cache of his diaries and letters, uh, I will be first in line to try and write the book on him because uh, he's a really neat guy and he goes through a lot of, of trials and tribulations during the war. So we'll keep going here. And this is gonna be the, the main setting for a lot of the first part of this presentation. This is the Baltimore bottleneck. Uh, as Larry Sable calls it. Um, this also shows up in a book called Victory Road the Rails uh, by George Edgar Turner, which is pretty much the standard book on uh, Civil War railroading uh, on both the North and the South. And 1861, Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States, and it's only served by one railroad. Uh, it's it's a freight and passenger railroad, and everything has to funnel through Baltimore or Relay, Maryland. Uh, the only other option is to go down uh, the Atlantic coast or down the Chesapeake Bay and in uh, to Alexandria or DC via the Potomac River. But if you're moving anything by freight train, 
the B and O is it. And Garrett wanted to keep that. In fact, during the war, he tries to shoot down uh, several proposals that were being entered into Congress to build a second railroad into Washington, D.C. that would not be owned by the BNO. Uh, and uh, he succeeds for a period of time until uh, Pennsylvania Railroad interests will wind up building what everybody who rides Amtrak between D.C. and New York gets to enjoy it today. Uh, one unique thing about this piece of railroad between Baltimore and Washington, it's not entirely owned by the BNO. Uh, this was partially financed by the state of Maryland and they get a portion of the revenues of what they call the Washington branch between Relay and Washington DC. And that was still in effect in the Civil War. And that is actually gonna play a role uh, in, July, in May and uh, April of 1861 in helping to protect the company from Confederate attack. So the first brush with uh, the war uh, starts in February 1861. This is a, a, one of the Stitt paintings. If you ever go to the B&O Museum in Baltimore, um, Herbert Stitt was an artist who was contracted to do a series of paintings for the company uh, that denoted uh, important events in the history. And several of them are on display at the museum. And all of them were used as covers in the company magazine. And this is a, a painting he did of Lincoln's arrival in Washington, DC, which is very ironic given the BNO was kind of iced out of, of taking a active part in the event. Um, Lincoln had won the 1860 election, South Carolina and states in the deep South had almost immediately seceded. Uh, Maryland looked questionable in terms of its loyalty and Baltimore looked very questionable and in fact dangerous to the president and his party. Uh, and by party, I mean his traveling party. Uh, he was being informed and his associates were being informed of potential plots by Alan Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Uh, the uh, uh, general in chief had dispatched agents, uh, Winfield Scott had dispatched agents into Baltimore to see if they could find anything. Uh, there are several books that have come out in the past 10 years about this. And it's almost, uh, there are four different agencies trying to uncover a potential plot against the president and uh, none of them are talking to each other, but they're all talking to Lincoln's people. And the threat is viewed to be um, real enough and substantial enough that uh, Samuel Felton, who's the president of the Philadelphia Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad and one of the people bankrolling one of these investigations contacts Lincoln's people in Harrisburg and says, look, we have got to get him in DC and we cannot do it in daytime. Uh, the original plan was he was gonna come down the Northern Central Railroad, which if you live in Baltimore, you've driven on the East Coast, parallels Interstate 83 and uh, is now a, a bike trail. And they were gonna ride in an open carriage between uh, the Calvert Street Station and Camden Station. And that was supposedly where the, the assassination was going to take place. Lincoln instead goes through town uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, he is uh, smuggled in as a, uh, on, the, on a, a Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore train. Uh, the BNO is instructed to hold their early morning train for DC for a special package from the president of the PWNB. And the relationship between the railroads was, was good enough that if even if you were a rival, if a railroad president said, can you hold your train for a special package? You did it. Uh, what they didn't tell the BNO was the special package was the president elect. And he goes into DC and the crew really doesn't know who's there until he gets out at the uh, 6th Street station and uh, shows up, walks by him, thanks for the lift. And on March 4th, 1861, he takes the oath of office to become the president. This is not good for the BNO. Uh, first off, Garrett feels insulted that they didn't trust him enough to, to openly protect the president. Uh, and second, uh, the two people who come into the, uh, the administration are openly hostile to the railroad. Uh, and that would be Secretary of War Simon Cameron and who would wind up becoming Assistant Secretary of War Thomas Scott. 
Cameron uh, despises Garrett. Uh, Cameron was president of the Northern Central Railroad. Uh, Garrett had tried to take over that company, and Garrett had gone to his friend in uh, Philadelphia, Tom Scott, and Scott's boss, John Thompson, who was the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and successfully put that railroad into the Pennsylvania Railroad's orbit and prevented its takeover by the BO. Cameron also was notoriously corrupt. And the War Department post was a plum appointment for someone who was going to give out patronage to his friends with the awarding of war contracts. Um, this is another thing people may need to be reminded of. There's something called the spoil system in place. There's no civil service in the US government at this time, and there will not be until uh, Chester Arthur signs the Civil Service Act uh, after the assassination of James Garfield. So when a new administration took office, if you were of the losing party, you got fired. Uh, and that went from postmaster up to cabinet secretary. And uh, there were certain cabinet posts that were more desirable than others, depending on what you wanted out of it. And if you wanted to award uh, points and money to friends who had helped you politically, uh, the best one was customs collector for the Port of New York. But another really good one was War Department because you could award a lot of contracts and you got to have basically zero oversight. Uh, Scott is going to show up a little later on and he's going to wind up running the railroads of the Union war effort. And it's actually quite successful, but uh, he is no friend of Garrett and will not be one uh, throughout the war. Winfield Scott is the current general in chief of the US Army when, the, uh, civil, when Lincoln takes the oath of office. He's, um, he's well past his prime, but he will not retire. And uh, he has a distinguished enough record going back to the War of 1812 that they really can't fire him. Um, However, he still has enough uh, of a sound military mind that he realizes that Washington, D.C. has no defense. And he has to keep that city safe. He has to keep the president safe. Um, even though Virginia is looking to leave, um, he is going to remain loyal to the United States. And he really doesn't care whose toes he steps on to accomplish his mission. Uh, so he knows that they need loyal uh, troops to defend the city. On April 13th, word reaches Washington that Fort Sumter has been fired upon. Uh, that means there's a shooting war and Scott's job is now much more urgent. So uh, the Lincoln administration calls for 75,000 volunteers to put down the rebe rebellion. That will push some of uh, the border states closer to the edge. In fact, Virginia just decides we have to secede because we will not allow Virginia troops to put down uh, a rebellion that we don't think is a rebellion. Uh, so they will, uh, Virginia will secede on April 17th, which is two days after Lincoln puts out the call for volunteers. Uh, on April 18th, the first volunteers are going to arrive in Washington, D.C. via the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And uh, that would be uh, uh, pencil troops from Pennsylvania. Uh, they actually go to Fort McHenry first. See what I did there, Shannon? Uh, and report for duty and then march from Fort McHenry to Camden Station and get on train cars to go to Washington. They don't have a problem. The Pennsylvania guys get yelled at, but nobody assaults them and nothing, you know, nothing bad happens except, you know, loud noises. There's more troops following them. Um, these are militia troops, so they are partially trained. Uh, they uh, are, are, are called up. They are volunteers. They are enthusiastic. For the most part, many of them are, are going to come through town unarmed. The 6th Massachusetts does not. They do carry their own arms. Uh, and this is a shot of them in Philadelphia boarding a train for Baltimore. Now, uh, after the first troops went through town, the people in Baltimore kind of were caught by surprise, and those who were in favor of Maryland seceding 
uh, were not happy with this fact. And the six Massachusetts when it gets to Baltimore, uh, there was a law passed shortly after railroads uh, implemented the use of steam locomotives that you could not run a steam locomotive on the streets of Baltimore. And uh, that caused a rather unique situation in the city. Uh, if you've ever been to Baltimore, there's the Inner Harbor. And kind of tucked off, hidden in the shadow of a hotel is the old PWD station. It's a very tiny building compared to the office towers around it. And it's off of Pratt Street, which is the main east-west street through town. It runs right along what had been the waterfront of the city. And Pratt Street goes to the uh, Camden Station. And there were railroad tracks in the middle of that street. And what would happen would be if you were on a train, you were going from the Philadelphia, Wilmington, Baltimore, you were going to Washington, your train car would be uncoupled from the locomotive and hooked up to a team of horses. And the horses would pull you down these tracks in the middle of the street to the B&O at Camden Station. And your car would get hooked on to a B&O train and take you into Washington. And it would work the other way if you were going to New York or Philadelphia from Washington, DC. Um, this was a slow process. It was a tedious process. And in the case of the uh, moving troops, it created a lot of vulnerability. And for the six Massachusetts, it put them in a very bad spot. Uh, a mob of pro-Southern uh, citizens of Baltimore and some people who just were looking for a fight uh, Baltimore also had a reputation of being called Mob Town, which is a whole nother talk, but a fascinating one nonetheless. Um, and they start getting uh, paving stones thrown at them. The, the tracks are blocked by paving stones and the sixth Massachusetts uh, winds up having to shoot into the crowd. Uh, there's also reports that someone shot into them and that led to the return of fire. Uh, this, uh, caused a huge amount of consternation, uh, and and Garrett was just beside himself. Uh, it was uh, it was a shock for for Baltimore. Um, it was a black mark on the city and a black mark on the railroad, uh, and it was a a a as far as the uh, union government was concerned. It showed that Baltimore was not loyal and the b &O could not be trusted. Uh, William Prescott Smith contacted Samuel Felton the day of the riot. He said, the day will be historical. It is evident that whatever our authorities may want in Maryland or Washington, the people of the state will fight to prevent any Northern troops passing through. I have never risked my own life so sadly before. Uh, we could not return our teams for your second train and it troops while remaining at President Street were attacked violently while in the cars there. The greater part of police being yet on the western border of town with the Boston Regiment. Uh, basically, Smith goes on to tell Felton, you can't, we can't guarantee the safety of people moving through Baltimore right now. And you need to stop moving troops through town because that's only going to make the situation worse. Um, this does not go over well in Washington, D.C. Uh, Governor Hicks uh, also contacts Washington and says, guys, we are in a mess here. Uh, we cannot control the city right now. Uh, the causes of Northern troops coming through, please don't move Northern troops through the state. Uh, he also sanctions uh, the burning of railroad bridges north of the city on the Northern Central Railroad uh, by a force of Maryland militia and some Baltimore uh, police forces are involved too. And that effectively isolates not only Baltimore, but Washington, D.C. from any form of reinforcement. So that leaves only the garrison at Fort McHenry and those troops that were already in Washington, D.C. and the militia to defend the city against uh, possibly the entirety of the Virginia militia that may be coming on, on towards Washington. Garrett tried to put, put down the violence. He tried to appeal to the mob. Uh, it was unsuccessful. And it's, it's, it doesn't help his, his standing in Washington after this that his own brother, 
Henry is in favor of the Confederacy. So Garrett's in a bad spot. Uh, the B&O is in a bad spot. Baltimore is in a bad spot. And Garrett at this point kind of starts looking at where things are going and, and, you know, he can count rifles as well as anybody else can. And he realizes that it's probably going to involve a lot of union troops uh, are going to show up in Baltimore to secure this railroad because they're not going to give up Washington, DC. Uh, he gets a telegram on the day of the riot uh, that says, Dear Sir, it is my duty to inform you that all Republicans must be removed from your road. Stationed from and beginning at Monocacy Bridge west to Harper's Ferry, we consider all your station men to be between to be such between those respective points. If they are not removed, your road will be made one continuous ruin by order committee 1500 Western Maryland men. Uh, this, is, this is a mess, just straight up, this is a mess. And the next unit of troops that's gonna come through or was due to come through Baltimore was the 8th Massachusetts uh, under the command of Benjamin Butler. Uh, Benjamin Butler, if uh, you are a Civil War buff, is the general you love to hate. Um, he is the uh, archetype of incompetent political general, and I would guess the cause of at least a dozen headaches for his bosses from Lincoln to Grant. Uh, however, in 1861, he is a valuable person. He is a war Democrat. He is a, a Massachusetts politician. He was uh, uh, able to maneuver himself to be commander, uh, a brigadier general in the Massachusetts militia. And at this early stage of the war, that gives him authority over all Massachusetts troops that uh, he happens to encounter. And he is traveling with the 8th Massachusetts Infantry. And uh, behind them are the 7th New York State Militia uh, out of New York City. They both have orders to get to Washington, D.C., and they can't go through Baltimore. Uh, now, fortunately for them, uh, there's, a, there's a, a ferry boat here in Perryville, Maryland, at the Philadelphia, Wilmington, Baltimore, uh, we're using. Uh, and there's some uh, additional marine uh, stock in the area that they can basically seize. Uh, since they can't go through Baltimore, and this is another Library of Congress map, uh, they're going to go around Baltimore. And Butler is going to take uh, these two regiments down the Chesapeake Bay to Annapolis, Maryland, uh, where they're going to land. And uh, then uh, they're going to utilize the uh, Annapolis and Elkridge Railroad here, which is now basically Route 3 slash Interstate 97 uh, to get to the B&O and then go into Washington, D.C. that way. Uh, in researching the Civil War, uh, I've been trying to do a project where I'm looking at the loyalty uh, of, of various soldiers who, who may have worked for railroads. Massachusetts actually took down the civilian job occupations of every soldier that they enlisted. And the 8th Massachusetts helpfully had a bunch of people who worked for the railroads. So when they landed Annapolis, uh, pro-secessionist forces in, in that area had torn up the railroad and take, literally taken apart the steam locomotive uh, that belonged to the Annapolis and Elkridge Railroad. Butler went to his regiment and said, does anybody know how to put together a steam locomotive and rebuild a railroad? And a bunch of people raised their hands. And Butler's regiment started to rebuild the railroad uh, and physically rebuild the locomotive. And they had an operating railroad line between Annapolis and Elkridge in, in fairly short or order. And that remained in operation for several weeks as the only ra direct rail communication between Washington, D.C. and the North. Now, this is not going to last. I mean, you just can't let a city as big as Baltimore remain uncontrolled and this is a, this is a this is a bootstrap fix for a major problem uh, in terms of transportation 
more troops are going to show up in Washington, D.C., and you're going to have to have the most efficient means possible to feed them, to clothe them. Uh, they're going to need it. Many of these troops do need ammunition. They do need weapons. Uh, and uh, you can't do that effectively with this kind of uh, hybrid uh, operation. So uh, Butler gets ordered to move up b &O and start securing more of the railroad. This is the Thomas Viaduct, uh, still standing and still in use as a railroad bridge to this day. Um, in my opinion, a, a triumph of the amateur engineer who over-engineers his work before it's, it's, it's built. Um, it was uh, done by Latrobe, uh, whose family did a lot of engineering work at this time. And uh, these are men of, of the Massachusetts Regiment who had helped to secure this, this bridge. Uh, Butler then gets orders to keep going north. From, and this comes from General in Chief Winfield Scott. Uh, he says, okay, go ahead and secure Baltimore. Uh, I want you to go by land and sea so that we can kind of do this quickly and by surprise. And we're not going to accidentally have another stand up fight. Scott's worried that there's going to be street fighting in the city. Uh, Butler says, I know better than that, and just decides to take a train with a thousand men and go into Baltimore and put artillery on Federal Hill. Uh, so if you've ever been to Federal Hill and you have the, you see the cannons there, uh, you can thank Ben Butler for, for putting that image uh, out there. Uh, basically went to Baltimore, put the cannons on the hill and said, you know, if anybody starts anything, we start firing into downtown. Uh, and I really don't care what happens after that. This does not go over particularly well with the general in chief who rightfully expects that, you know, when he says, I want you to go by land and sea, you're going to go by land and sea, but they can't fire him. So uh, to get him out of the way, they promote Butler and send him down to uh, Fort Monroe, Virginia, where hopefully he will stay out of trouble. Uh, and if you follow Ben Butler's career after that, you know that at this point, this is where the studio audience should start laughing uh, because he will continue to cause trouble for the next four years. However, Butler's rather impetuous move into Baltimore does allow for the railroad line to be open. Uh, the Northern Central bridges get rebuilt at government expense. Shocker that the Secretary of War got the government to pay for repairing the railroad that he was formerly the president of. Um, and because of the issues that had happened in Baltimore, the questionable uh, loyalty of the city and the B&O Railroad employees, the War Department just decides we're going to take over the B&O Railroad outright between Baltimore and Washington. And uh, Tom Scott is brought down from the Pennsylvania Railroad to basically run the war efforts uh, for the Union in terms of transportation. Uh, he brings uh, other executives down to run the BNO. Uh, for the BNO, unfortunately, this means that any chance they could have made money moving troops and supplies for the government uh, or the private business people who would uh, be trying to sell material to the government directly, it's gone. They can't move passengers on the Washington branch. They, they cannot move freight. Uh, this is all being controlled by the War Department. Uh, Garrett in fact, in the uh, late spring goes to the War Department and says, can we please run passenger trains between the two cities if they don't interfere with War Department traffic? Uh, and Cameron basically says, mm, maybe, but we'll have to sign off on any train movement. And pretty much that guarantees that that's not gonna happen while Pennsylvania Railroad executives are running the show. Uh, so unfortunately for Garrett, uh, he is, his loyalty is questioned, but he said enough of the right things and he knows enough of the right people. And the Lincoln administration doesn't wanna really antagonize Maryland any worse than it already is antagonized. He's left in charge of what's left of the BNO. Uh, they don't arrest him. Uh, 
They arrest other Marylanders for disloyalty, but they leave Garrett where he is. Um, and again, part of that is, is his position, and part of it is his connections. And they really just, you know, it, it would not be a good thing uh, for the administration to, to do this. And he's powerless anyway at this point, as far as the War Department's concerned. Uh, the railroad that they need is run by the War Department. So they're fine. Uh, and if we, you know, if that's fine, they're happy. Uh, however, you know, Garrett's having a, a bad spring and it's gonna get worse. Uh, if you thought things between Baltimore and Washington were bad, in Virginia, this is where things get really, really, really sticky. Uh, this is Harper's Ferry. Uh, this is pre-Civil War uh, because this bridge is still there. Uh, by August of 1861, this bridge will not exist anymore. Uh, and I'm, I'm foreshadowing, but this is not going to be the first bridge that gets taken out of Harper's Ferry. So Virginia will secede uh, after Lincoln uh, requests for uh, uh, 75,000 volunteers. The Harper's Ferry Arsenal, which in 1859 had been the target of uh, John Brown's raid and was one of the largest arsenals in the U.S. Uh, War Department system, uh, was protected by 12, a detachment of 12 soldiers and uh, one night watchman. And after Virginia secedes, the local militia forces are sworn into state service. And that's, that's Harper's Ferry Arsenal is the first target. There's a lot of weapons there, but more importantly, there are machine tools that can be used to make more weapons. And the South needs that. Virginia wants to secure that themselves. And seeing that that 12 guys are not going to be able to effectively defend that city. Uh, they go ahead and burn the arsenal in hopes of, of removing that uh, as, a, as an asset. Uh, that's done on April 18th. Uh, once Virginia troops show up, uh, they will uh, secure the site, what's left of it. Uh, the material that can be salvaged is sent south, uh, but the arsenal will never return to the city, uh, to the town of Harper's Ferry. Uh, it will wind up becoming a very nice ruin at the National Park. Uh, the BNO had a, uh, had a telegrapher on site, uh, Charles Ways. And in doing research, he actually was one of the few employees who wrote down their recollections of the events of the time. He had started working for the company in the 1850s. And uh, he was on duty during the John Brown raid. Uh, he had been on duty during some of the memorable floods. And in 1908, he wrote a, uh, a letter to the company, which interestingly enough, the company wound up making a copy and sending it to the uh, Bureau of Railway Economics Library in uh, Washington, DC, which itself now made its way to the Berger Library. And I found this uh, in our collection. Uh, and it's a fascinating little document. There's, there's, it's one of those things that it's a great tease. I wish he had written more about his time on the railroad, but he remembered uh, when the arsenal was captured by Virginia troops that the Virginia militia played Dixie and raised the flag uh, when they seized the site. And he uh, abandoned his post uh, and went to Sandy Hook. Uh, they were still allowing trains to run, but he was not in a position where he could be safe. So we went to a place called Sandy Hook, Maryland. It's west of a town called Brunswick. And if you ever drive west of Baltimore, Washington, and you get to Frederick and you take US Route 340 towards West Virginia, uh, you will go by that, uh, what's left of that town. If you, uh, if you take the CNO Canal National Park, uh, you, you, you have a better view of it uh, on the towpath, uh, but that was, that became his operating station on and off throughout the rest of the war. Now the Virginia militia winds up being commanded by, at the time, this obscure colonel who was an instructor at BMI named Thomas Jackson. Jackson was an early proponent for what we would call the hard war. And he uh, was all about cutting the railroad. He's like, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's, this is, I'm seeing trains full of, of coal move through. It's, got to be for the war effort. Um, and in fact, he sends a telegram to Richmond saying, you know, I'm, I'm, 
this is all steam coal for the Navy and we've got to get rid of it because it's going to hurt us in the long run. And, uh, you know, he's told knock it off uh, by, by, his, uh, by his boss, uh, Governor Letcher and Robert E. Lee, who is the commander of Virginia forces. They tell him, look, that's a, the B&O at this time is a significant asset to the state of Maryland. We don't want to alienate them and push them away from seceding. So knock it off. Uh, and in fact, uh, there is a, there's a letter from Lee himself, basically, you know, ordering Jackson, you will not uh, prevent any freight trains from running on the B&O uh, because of this. Now, uh, one thing Garrett did do, because uh, you know he's being allowed to operate through Virginia by the largesse of the Virginia military and civilian leadership, um, he knows he can't protect any militia going through Baltimore, and he for sure can't protect people going through Virginia. And when the governor of Ohio says, I've got a regiment of troops and I need to move them to Washington, D.C. because they've been asked to report there, Garrett says, I can't do it. I cannot guarantee their safety. Um, I, I'm, we're going to refuse the, uh, the order. Uh, governor Dennison hears that as, I'm not moving Union troops and tells the War Department that. This is just fodder for Cameron and his team. Uh, they are more than happy to tell Governor Dennison of Ohio to move his troops up towards uh, Steubenville or, uh, and will uh, march them over into, Pittsburgh, into the Pittsburgh area, and the Pennsylvania Railroad will be happy to move those troops towards Washington, D.C. Oh, and by the way, here's the bill. Um, and at that point, Cameron's like, fine, we won't move any War Department traffic over the B&O west of Washington, D.C., uh, we'll use the Pensy. Uh, that was fine with him. That was fine with his his cronies in Harrisburg and Philadelphia. Uh, and another body blow to Garrett's standing in Washington. Uh, in in consequence, he's still trying to move whatever freight he can. Uh, so long as Virginia's going to let him run trains, he's going to run trains because right now what they call the main stem, which is the line to Wheeling, and the northwest branch, which is what the railroad that runs from Parkersburg to Grafton on what is essentially US 50. Uh, so long as that's running, that's making the company money. And right now that's the only thing making the company money. And he is going to keep as many people happy as he can. Uh, he lets the state of Virginia know, I am not moving Union troops over the BNO. Uh, Maryland has not officially seceded, but it officially has not been prevented from seceding still. Uh, Jackson is not happy about it. Virginia is still nominally at peace because though it voted to secede, it has not been ratified. And we're kind of in uh, what would have been called in 1940, 1939, the phony war uh, in, in Western Virginia. That starts to change as the vote for secession is ratified. Uh, Jackson gets a guy on his staff named Thomas Sharp. Uh, he's an engineer. Uh, and Sharp uh gets brought in on a plan. Uh, Jackson is pretty confident that uh, the, the state is going to approve and ratify the vote of secession. And on May 23rd, 1861, when the vote is formally ratified, Jackson decides, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to pinch off the B&O and we are going to take every piece of useful material we can from the company and use it for the Confederate war effort. Uh, he's in Harpers Ferry. There is a major shop facility in Martinsburg, West Virginia, part of which still stands and can be viewed to this day. Uh, 
there's a lot of equipment in that area. And the machine shop, just like the machines at Harper's Ferry, are considered quite valuable. Garrett is so caught up in trying to keep everybody happy, he's not really looking at the potential of um, having something horrible happen to the company uh, in Virginia. He's hoping that uh, while Maryland is still potentially able to secede, Virginia will not take any offensive action. Uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, what Jackson does, he takes a regiment at Harper's Ferry and closes the railroad. He goes towards a place called Cherry Run, West Virginia, which is uh, west of Martinsburg and closes the railroad there. And everything between those two regiments of troops, he takes or he destroys. And Sharp gets the job of moving the locomotives and rolling stock that can be used by the Confederacy south. And that in itself is a very interesting story and worthy of its own talk. Uh, he's got to go from Martinsburg, which is way up here, to Strasburg, Virginia, uh, essentially following US Route 11, which was the Valley Turnpike. And that's the closest railroad connection that um, the Confederacy can use to bring those railroads into the Confederate, uh, these, the railroad equipment into the Confederate war effort. Uh, it's pretty simple. The, the turnpike's got a, a macadamized surface. Uh, you have locomotives uh, that are fairly substantial, uh, but still uh, light enough that could be moved. Uh, sharp and his people will lighten them even more. This is actually a a uh, locomotive that was being restored at the uh, b &O Railroad Museum shop, but I took a picture of it because that's basically what they did to get these locomotives down the turnpike. Uh, they didn't take the cab off. There should be a wooden cab here, but they took the drivers off. They uncoupled the tender. They tried to get as much weight off of the locomotive as possible, and they hooked it up to draft horses and oxen and just rolled them down uh, the valley pike. And if you notice, um, look at the wheels. Uh, these flanges are pretty flat. So it's easier to move uh, these kind of locomotives down uh, the Valley Turnpike than what you would think of as a modern railroad wheel, which has, has a deeper flange. Uh, there's a much more detailed engineering talk that could be given about that. And there are better people who are, are more versed in that than I am to, to tell you what's going on with that. But it facilitates road movement for this particular uh, objective. So the railroad gets a lot of stuff uh, stolen. Uh, there has been some controversy about this. Uh, James Robertson, who was a uh, professor at Virginia Tech and probably the definitive biographer of Stonewall Jackson, uh, felt that the story was fictitious. Uh, the property records, however, show this really happened. This is from the Garrett Papers at the B&O Museum. And there are the locomotives carried south, carried south, carried south, carried south, carried south. Uh, these were locomotives that were taken uh, in 1861 by the Confederates. Uh, and in fact, after the war, the company sends a young junior uh, manager south with uh, orders and letters from the War Department to find the stolen equipment and get it back. Uh, there's an unpublished uh, monograph at the Smithsonian Library Archives that talks about this guy's mission. It's, it's fascinating. It would make a, a neat little documentary on its own where this guy is going through the devastated railroad infrastructure of the South looking for locomotives that themselves may have been destroyed. And he's got to prove either that piece of equipment belonged to the B&O or that burned piece of junk used to be part of the B&O to get compensation for it. Um, it again, a neat story, and and you can actually interlibrary loan the book from the Smithsonian Archive, so it, it's worth it's worth looking at. Uh, but the the records show this really did happen. The romanticized version, probably not. So Joe Johnson comes in charge, and I know we're getting short on time. Uh, 
the Confederacy now is in charge in earnest and they start blowing things up. The Harper's Ferry Bridge is destroyed. The locomotives are run into the Potomac River. Martinsburg shops are burned to the ground. Uh, the Colonnade Bridge, which had been a, a notable engineering piece on the railroad in Martinsburg, destroyed. And still further west, B&O employees who were members of the Virginia militia were going around using their employee pass to burn railroad bridges in Western Virginia. Uh, the railroad is a wreck and Garrett's in big trouble. Fortunately, some people in Western Virginia decide we don't want to do this anymore. And uh, they don't want to be part of the Confederacy and they vote to rejoin the Union in Wheeling. This brings the attention of Ohio and they appeal to help for, from Ohio. The governor, Denison here, sends a guy named George McClellan who was a railroad president and a friend of Garrett uh, in charge. And he sends troops across the river to occupy Wheeling and Parkersburg. He also sends a guy named Frederick Lander along. Lander and McClellan had worked together during the 1855 railroad surveys. And uh, Lander is an aggressive guy and he appreciates the importance of the railroad and he's gonna protect it. This, along with Benjamin Kelly, who was a former B&O employee who joined the new Virginia loyal uh, government as a colonel in the 1st Virginia Infantry. These are guys who want to protect the B&O, and they're the first friends Garrett sees in the War Department with any kind of authority since the war started. They go to Grafton, Virginia, and basically secure the railroad line from Grafton West. Uh, Kelly gets wounded, McClellan wins a battle at Philippi, Virginia, and Essentially, from Grafton to the Ohio River, the B&O is safe. Unfortunately, that doesn't get you from Grafton to Baltimore. That commander is uh, in that area is William Patterson. He's a Pennsylvania militia general, and he's a footnote. He doesn't do much in the war. Uh, his big significant contribution is he lets Joseph Johnson get away uh, to fight at the Battle of, of Bull Run and defeat Irvin McDowell's forces. He goes to Falling Waters, Virginia, fights a little skirmish, turns around and goes home. Uh, by July of 1861, this is what the B&O looks like. This is that wonderful wooden bridge at Harper's Ferry, gone. This is the bridge at Martinsburg, gone. And Cameron has no interest in helping out. And Scott is saying, look, I need every soldier I can get to defend Washington, DC and more important points. The B&O is just going to have to wait. So the B&O has to do all the repairs on their own. They start where they can work safely, which is in West Virginia. This is a U.S. military railroad crew in, the, uh, in Virginia, but it's a great view of just manual labor. This all has to be done by hand, uh, and it's slow, laborious work. And these guys don't like to work if they're getting shot at. So unless you can protect them, these guys are not going to show up to work and fix your railroad. Uh, they do repair the bridge at Harper's Ferry uh, with a uh, Bowman Iron Trust bridge, which does not burn as quickly as the wooden bridge, but will still get destroyed. Uh, there are going to be several bridges at Harper's Ferry. Stonewall Jackson shows up again in the Shenandoah Valley area and prevents work from being done west of Harper's Ferry and east of Cumberland. Uh, George McClellan gets brought east to command the military division of the Potomac. Frederick Lander gets brought east to Cumberland, Maryland to help protect the railroad. And McClellan is gonna wind up getting promoted in November to general in chief, which is still more good news for the B&O. So Garrett's fortunes are starting to improve. And in fact, McClellan, when he becomes commander of forces in the Potomac River area, writes to uh, the War Department saying, we need to start paying the B&O to use their trains. It's a big change. Uh, in the fall and winter, things get better. There's a fight in Romney, West Virginia. Romney, Virginia becomes West Virginia, uh, where General Kelly and uh, General Lander defeat Confederate forces and protect the railroad. It allows this, this important section here to be fixed. And even better, Simon Cameron gets fired because he is so corrupt that it attracts the attention of Congress 
and Lincoln has to get rid of him. And they bring in a guy named Edwin M. Stanton, who was James Buchanan's attorney general and also a railroad lawyer who had worked with the BNO on several cases in Ohio. Garrett has finally had most of his enemies purged. Tom Scott's still in the War Department, but he's not under the protection of Cameron that he, that he uh, had earlier on. Stanton, McClellan, uh, and thankfully, the increase in numbers of volunteers allow enough troops to finally be put into the field to protect the railroad. And finally, in March of 1862, the BO gets reopened for about six months. And then uh, the long war continues. And that's a talk for another day. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, if um, Let me also go ahead and bring that up. I will send this to Shannon if uh, anybody wants it. These are the sources that I, I've used and also some helpful further reading if you wanna uh, dive deeper into the history. Uh, and if we have time, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I'm gonna go ahead and stop uh, screen sharing now. And okay. Uh, so folks, if you have any questions for Nick, you can either put them in the chat or just, um, actually that might be the easiest since we have a lot of folks on this call. Yeah. Um, just put them in the chat, please. And I'm also gonna provide you with some links to the Barrier Library, of course, um, where, where Nick is the curator, and then a couple of the National Park Service sites that he mentioned. So Chesapeake in Ohio and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Harpers Ferry. And of course, there's always Fort McHenry. Yes. Okay. Don't, I'm don't see anything, anything just yet. Also, you guys are getting a tie today. I haven't worn a tie for like a year, so. And also the BNO Museum, if you do want to, that I know they're reopened again. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, the BNO Railroad Museum is actually a great visit. Oh, we have something from Beth Van Horn. Um, whoa, they're all coming in. Yeah. Is it fair uh, to say? Go ahead. Is it fair to say the structure of the BNO led to the creation of West Virginia? That's part of it. Um, West Virginia, uh, the Western counties were being, uh, they felt they were being slighted by the government in Richmond. And the BNO was a big economic boost for them. Uh, so uh, that didn't help. But uh, the big thing was they felt they weren't being listened to. And their economic interests were more in the orbit of Ohio and the Ohio River and southwestern Pennsylvania. So um, they decided to, to take advantage and, and just bounce. Uh, and it's interesting, they originally went back in as the restored government of Virginia. They didn't become West Virginia until 1863. This is uh, Paul Denton in Easton, Maryland. Nick Fry, can you hear me? I can hear you, Paul. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, first of all, I want to say it was an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, the only question I have is, how long has the beard been there? I have never seen Nick Fry with a beard. The, this is the quarantine beard. It started uh, when we shut the library down on March 22nd of 2020. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm on the fence about whether or not I'm going to keep it once the pandemic's over. People have said they like it, but um, we'll see how it lasts in the summer. Looks good. Thanks Thank again you. for a great presentation. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for attending. Right. Uh, Let's see, Eli uh, has a question. What amount of the BNO's pre-war freight traffic was cotton or other cargo would be affected by secession? They were not a big cotton railroad. Um, the traffic that they tended to move the most of in terms of tonnage was coal. Uh, and that was one of the big profit centers on the railroad. In fact, it remained one of the big profit centers up to the CSX era. And it's only started to, to change uh, now that the coal market has, has radically changed and the energy market has changed. 
Uh, they saw a lot of manufactured goods uh, that did include clothing. Uh, they saw a lot of flour, but a lot of cotton was being moved by ship. Um, the Mississippi River trade really took a lot of that because cotton was something that didn't need to, it was bulky. It wasn't particularly heavy compared to coal. It was actually a lot more efficient to ship it by riverboat than by railroad. Uh, tobacco, processed tobacco did find its way on B&O trains. And in fact, if you go to the museum, you can pull the um, company reports. And I think even in the published reports in the 1850s and 60s would tell you what the commodities were. And it was coal was the biggest freight revenue maker and then passengers and mail were the, the uh, non-freight revenue sources. Um, Gary had a question about the presentation. Yes, uh, I can send a copy of the presentation to Shannon and also I can make that available uh, other ways uh, as a PDF if anybody wants it. Um, Charles had a question. I understand Mrs. Lincoln and the children arrived in DC later. Were they subject to any threats also? No, it's almost like the mob in that the kids and the wives were considered civilians. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln and the kids arrived on the scheduled route on the scheduled train to Calvert Street and they got in the open carriage and everybody waited for Lincoln to come out and he didn't and they left. And the crowd was disappointed and Garrett was there with other dignitaries and he was kind of like, so where's the president elect? And when he found out he was disappointed, but they still were a good host to Mary and the kids. Uh, and they made it through Baltimore without any problem. They rode, it, rode in the carriage, they were not attacked. They got on the train to DC and they arrived safely without incident. Uh, James had a question about what effect did the gauges of rail have on all these movements. In the north, the gauge was pretty much set at four feet, eight and a half inches. Uh, the Erie is the exception. Ohio had different gauges, but Maryland and Pennsylvania and New York, with the Erie as the exception, and New Jersey and New England were pretty much all four feet, eight and a half, and um, it wasn't a problem to move trains uh, uh, or troops this way. The bigger problem was the fact that the railroads didn't connect in many cities directly. You had to transfer. Um, either with Baltimore, you had to have the horses draw the cars across the city, or they just didn't physically connect at all. The idea of a union station was not common. The idea of a unified, seamless freight network was not common. Most of these companies were rivals enough that they had no interest in helping the other one move freight. And, uh, you know, at, at Wheeling, there's no bridge across the river at Wheeling. There's no bridge across the river at Parkersburg for freight cars. You unload, you put it on the ferry boat, you go to the other railroad. After, you know, once the B&O gets paid, they don't care. Uh, it's not until the network starts expanding that they start uh, bringing things together and then uh, the realization that our customers are not happy if they have to do this added expense. Um, let's see. Nancy has a question about how do you get a recording of the broadcast? Shannon, I think that's when you, you you have to answer. Yeah. Um, so the recording was actually done by the Friends of Fort McHenry. And so um, if you look in the chat, I've placed their website for the Friends of Fort McHenry on there. Um, they're going to be posting these, uh, the whole series on their YouTube channel. Um, so just keep an eye out there. If you go to the Friends of Fort McHenry's webpage, there'll be a link to their, their YouTube um, and you can get, you can get the whole thing. Thank you. Uh, Tom uh, has a question. The eastern counties of West Virginia were, were included in the state to protect the BNO. Yes, after West Virginia was finally formally established and Virginia was reconstructed, the three counties from Harpers Ferry West uh, that become the panhandle of West Virginia, they were added in, uh, in some cases against their will, uh, to become part of West Virginia. And that was partially at the insistence of the BNO. Uh, uh, they did not want to have anything more to do with Virginia uh, on the main line. Garrett still wanted to go down the Shenandoah Valley, but the main line, he was like, nope, nope, nope. They just make that all West Virginia. Um, 
uh, Mike's, I think this is Mike. He had a question about uh, BNO's association with Ross Winans taint the perception of them as pro Southern in spring of 1861. By 1861, the BNO and Ross Winans were not speaking civilly to each other. There is a huge blow up uh, when uh, hey, hon, the new. Show me how you do the. The new. Master of uh, master mechanic for the railroad comes in and wants to uh, incorporate new railroad locomotive designs. And Winans was a stubborn old cuss at that point and had no tolerance for a new idea that said, you know, maybe if you put these little wheels on the front of the locomotive, they'll stay on the track better and they won't have to be as big and we can still run these trains on on these tight curves Winans wanted nothing to do with it they sued each other in court over it and by 1861 they were not friends uh which is interesting Winans was 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 well known enough in the city that um it was a uh he was arrested because of pro-southern uh uh sympathies but um yeah they were not they were not uh, really associated by the spring of 1861. Uh, Andrew Roberts had a question about when Lincoln spoke to the crowd in Frederick, uh, how did the BNO handle his transport? In 1862, they could get him as far as Frederick safely. From that point on, he had to take a carriage. And the old main line, which is uh, from Baltimore to Point of Rocks, Maryland, through Carroll County and Howard County, Baltimore County, and Frederick County, that was that was pretty safe. Uh, that really doesn't get touched by war, uh, except during the, the three invasions of the state of Maryland, really. So they take him to Frederick, and they take him out of Frederick. And that's as far as they carry him. West of Frederick, uh, the railroad was pretty much wrecked anyway. And uh, that was how we got into and out of, of uh, Antietam. Uh, Gary Previtz asked a question, what have I found out about the Washington branch during this time? Um, Basically, uh, what's there is covered in James Diltz's The Great Road and Summers' uh, book on the BNO and the Civil War. Uh, it's pretty extensive in that the, the, the Washington branch was a very busy piece of railroad at the time. Uh, what's interesting is to see the proposals in 65 to build another railroad and how Garrett continually works to shoot them down. Uh, it's almost like the whack-a-mole game. Uh, was any Hampton iron ore used for the BNO? I do not know uh, what, uh, where the sources for the iron ore were. A lot of the rails were imported at the early days of the railroad because the U.S. steel industry or the U.S. iron industry was not capable of manufacturing them. Uh, they started their own iron works after the war in Cumberland, and they did have a uh, a facility at Mount Clare to do some casting, uh, but I don't know the sourcing. I'd have to go into the company records to try and find that if they still exist. Uh, let's see. Uh, what was the name of the BNO official sent to find the stolen BNO equipment and the manuscript about him? Uh, it's by Larry Sagel. I will have to go into my records to pull that for you, Eli. If you want to email me at fry n f r y n at umsl edu, I can get you that that link. Um, let's see. Did the BNO have any difficulty hiring laborers to destroy the right of way, knowing that Marylanders were sympathetic to the Southern cause at the time, and were they paid per diem rates or hired under contracts? Um, the biggest difficulty they had was knowing they were going to get shot at. Um, that. That was the biggest obstacle. In fact, there's correspondence in the company files at the BO Museum where uh, Garrett's writing to the War Department saying, I need people to protect my guys with shovels because they won't do anything if people keep shooting at them. And if you want this railroad to run, they can't be shot at. So I need troops. Uh, interestingly enough, this creates a uh, the impetus for a unit called the Maryland Potomac Home Brigade, which was a way Maryland was able to meet its troop requirement 
for the U.S. government in terms of numbers of men entered into federal service, but the Maryland Potomac Home Brigade was a home defense force. And in my research, I found a lot of B&O workers join the Potomac Home Brigade so they don't have to go into active field campaigning, but they're protecting their job, in this case, the B&O Railroad from attack. Uh, for sympathies, that's one of the big things I'm researching is where were the sympathies? I found evidence in early 1861 where employees are questioned by military authorities or arrested because of pro-Southern statements they make or pro-Southern actions. Uh, Colonel Wiley is the most overt example where his employee pass that he used to get on the steam locomotive to burn the bridges uh, was captured by Benjamin Kelly, who was the B&O agent in Wheeling leading the 1st Virginia Infantry at Philippi, given to George McClellan, who did not forward it to the War Department. He held on to it and gave it to John Garrett in the 1870s as a keepsake. Uh, and that's in the Garrett family papers at the Library of Congress. And that was, that was great because it's literally a smoking gun about Southern sympathy with, with railroad employees. From what I'm finding, the real firebrands left the company service early in the war uh, when it became apparent Maryland wasn't going to stay in the Union. And the internal security that was underway in Baltimore and Western Virginia was sufficiently severe enough that they had a hard time sabotaging the railroad. So a lot of them just were like, you know, I'm just going to get a job and try not to get drafted and not, you know, not go into service. Uh, the biggest problem was the company was having trouble keeping employees who were getting shot at. And later in 1863, the draft was taking people away. And Garrett was able to get the War Department to exempt certain railroad employee classes from being drafted. Uh, they did also make use of contractors, but the contractors had the same problems uh, that the railroad had. And from what I've seen, the employees that did the work were being paid daily rates and not under contracts. Uh, the manual labor was very much a show up, sign here, here's your shovel, go move that dirt. Uh, if you were a skilled employee, you had a greater chance of being under a contract, but in most cases it was per diem anyway. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of books in the 19th, about 19th century employee mobility, and it, there's one called Working for the Railroad that really dives into it. It's, it's quite interesting. Yes, Robert Garrett, uh, Wade Rice just posted, Robert Garrett, who became a president of the BNO, did serve in Lee's army for a period of time, and Garrett had to keep that from embarrassing the family more. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. Does uh, anyone have anything else? Okay. No, I, I don't see anything else here. Um, so thanks again, Nick, for joining us. Um, <laughs> it was really good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, and I'm glad that, that so many of you could join us today. Um, keep an eye out. We do have um, another, another session coming up on the 30th. We're going to be joined by a friend of ours from the um, National, <clears throat> excuse me, National Civil War Museum of Medicine. Um, Jake Wynn's going to be talking to us about um, Claire Barton and her, her time in Washington in 1861. Again, if you check out any of those national parks that, uh, that Nick mentioned, so you have Harpers Ferry and the Chesapeake in Ohio, um, or the CNO Canal, I should say, and of course, Fort McHenry, uh, lots of information there. And then again, the link to the Barrier Library. Hmm? We shouldn't forget Monocacy. Yes, can't forget, I'm sorry. I almost forgot Monocacy. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Nick. You're welcome. But, uh, anyway, thank you guys all for attending. If you have any other questions, um, you can always get in touch with, um, with Nick gave you his email, or you can just let us know at Fort McHenry that you have some questions just by contacting the park. Uh, so thank you all, and I hope you have a great weekend. Um, and again, keep an eye out at the Fr For Friends of Fort McHenry website because they'll be posting the videos for each one of these. So with that, have a good afternoon.